we are amazingly right on time. Um, and we have about a half hour for, for questions. Um, Right, and then it's time for lunch, so um, <laughs> maybe 25 minutes for questions. I, I, I think this has, been, this has been a really interesting, interesting set of talks. We've heard about the challenges and importance of allowing for variability and uncertainty in uh, pandemic preparedness planning, the need to spend more time measuring, particularly post hoc analyses, um, and, uh, and maybe more time investigating the, the social response, the economic impact model. Um, the, we heard about the importance of human behavior and introducing that into modeling, uh, particularly the, the idea of susceptible individuals who, who's changing, changing their behavior changes the course of epidemics. And then um, Tom's discussion of GCBRs and the potential of these and their potential impact on, on governance, on foreign relations in society, and the call for more economic analyses looking at these. So with that, let me open it up for, for questions. Um, and, and we'll start with Peter over here. Yeah, thanks very much, Rebecca. Um, great talks, and obviously, this, for me, this is a great session, because I, I think these diseases are very, very interesting. Carlos, I want to ask you very specifically, and others comment as well. You, you made a little comment, not off the cuff, um, about how the... Um, how you're bringing in human behavior sort of changes the value or changes the way we need to look at the, the this sort of obsession with the r naught or r zero of an outbreak um which which actually made makes it into the media quite a lot you know we it's quite sophisticated these days when there's a new outbreak you get it from the um from the papers what what the r naught of ebola is in drc or something it's quite interesting but what, what, is the, what are the implications of what you've been doing on hu bringing human behavior into models for that sort of discussion? In general, the, the value of our, uh, our not has to do, uh, in some sense, with uh, the underlying assumptions of the problem, um, the mixing is homogeneous. But, but every time you add heterogeneity, for example, in the case of HIV, different modes of transmission, then you don't get a single endemic state, you get multiple endemic states, and where you wind up is a function of initial conditions. And that's being pretty much bypassed because then things become very complicated. In the case of tuberculosis, for example, uh, whether or not this exogenous infections or not, but if there is exogenous infection, I've seen some people in Europe just to think that, then the same thing happens. So every time you add heterogeneity to the model, and every time, and that can happen. When you add social dynamics and social behavior, then the changes are more dramatic because the landscape is constantly changing. In this particular case that I talk, you know, I just talk the difference between three groups of people depending upon their epidemiological status and how they change their decisions based on uh, what they value and the costs associated with that. But in general, in these models, that they people at different ages will make different decisions. People of different groups will make different decisions. So you can see that the level of complexity increases dramatically. And then this general idea that there is going to be a single endemic state breaks down. In fact, there are multiple endemic states. And it's interesting because even in the work of Sual Wright, when he talks about evolutionary landscapes, he talks of many peaks and valleys. He doesn't talk about a single peak. And in some sense, when we are thinking of a single peak, it's almost like there is a single endemic state. Now, I think, I think of course, uh, to make in short-term decisions, then I think that you can think in those terms. But when you start to think at the long-term dynamics or consequence of this and, um, and so forth, then it becomes different. And then it becomes very important to find ways, like uh, I was talking before, the case of the uh, smoking and the, and, and the tobacco industry the massive campaigns that, that took place, not only to treat those that were heavy smokers, but to actually educate about everybody so that everybody took a different position in, with respect to, for example, secondary smoke and things like that. And when that happens, the, the landscape changes, the dynamics change dramatically that if we were only going to focus on those that were heavy smokers. So heterogeneity is, is a, a really, complicated that it gets ignored because it, you know, it gets on, on the way of finding, uh, uh, so to speak, uh, 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 
policies that can be easily implemented. Now, I think the policies that have been implemented, so to speak, are the best that we have, but I think that we are missing a lot of important possibilities by ignoring behavior. And it goes back to the fact that what I believe is the most important problem in science is how to assess uncertainty. And uh, behavior brings a new component, and the social dynamics bring a new component, the travel, trade, all those kinds of things make things very complicated. Um, so I have, uh, I think we'll go with Jeff first, and then, um, oh, Je Jeff or Jennifer? I, I, and then I've got a couple of other folks. Mukesh, you're now in line, too. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Sorry I can't look at you and ask my question at the same time, but it was an <laughs> outstanding session. Um, my question is about, you know, as a public health person, we spend some amount of time, relatively small, investigating pseudo-outbreaks. Yet these have real uh, implications for, uh, for people and uh, economic costs. And I'm just wondering if you've seen any consideration of a uh, pseudo outbreak, um, modeling a pseudo outbreak, for instance, social media media generated outbreak that would result in mass hysteria and real changes in behavior and, and con health consequences. For example, you could think of autism, the autism scare as a pseudo outbreak that had real impacts and continues to have real impacts on our ability to conduct an effective uh, immunization program in the U.S. So um, just wanted to throw that out there and see if, uh, if any of you have considered that or seen anything that would look at that type of uh, scenario. So, so I think, yes, um, and it, this actually leads on from the previous question, how do you change human behavior or how do you account for it? It's actually very difficult. You can put in lots of assumptions in the model. The thing is particularly uh, in public health officials, you make all your major decisions about how you're going to do a response, how much resources, what is going to be at least initially your strategy and tactics and responding right up front before you even have all the information. And that includes you have no real idea at the beginning exactly how people are going to respond to your interventions because very often you haven't deployed them all. So you're guessing that what you can do in modeling is that you can make assumptions, uh, you do this by proxy by saying, talking about differences, what well, compliance. Are people going to uh, isolate themselves correctly so as to reduce or prevent onward transmission? What percentage of the population is going to do that? And how might that change over time? And you can build that into the model and see. But can you guarantee to policymakers on day one when you started the model and it's right at the beginning that that's going to, no, you, this is where you get, get some data from previous outbreaks. But as somebody said, you know, when you've seen one influenza pandemic, you've seen one because the next one's going to be different. Um, all you know really is that it's very foolish to assume that humans are all going to uh, act logically and they're all going to act the same. They're not. And in fact, even in Ebola, we saw after months and spending hundreds, if not billions of dollars trying to get people to change their uh, behavior and spent money invested in doing things like safe burial towards the airport end of those outbreaks, we saw a reduction in the percentage of people that were being uh, properly isolated either in Ebola treatment units and or at home and, uh, and safe burials when needed. That's why we had these long, thin tails, because people began to go back to their old habits. There's a resistance. There's a natural tendency. You look out the door, Ebola isn't around. One of my cousins died. I'm going to hold a traditional funeral. Wait, you shouldn't be doing that. We're not sure. Did the cousin die? It doesn't matter. You know, Ebola's gone, and you find, indeed, that cousin had Ebola. That was a story from uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, and from that point of view, the public health official trying to track all of that down is actually running, running hard to catch up because people's behaviors have changed faster than that they can. Because, again, you know, people get tired of hearing the same thing. People, it's hard to believe that in West Africa, the populace hadn't heard about Ebola to, you know, in January and February of 2015. Of course they did. But they made some decisions that said, no, we won't treat every death as if, we, as if it was in November of 2014. So bottom line is that, yes, you can assume that behaviors will change. What the public health people want to know up front is the magnitude. And on that one, you have to be cautious and just say, there's going to be a great deal of variability. What are you going to do if you only get this kind of response? What are you going to do if you get this kind of response? I, I, I'll give you two examples. In the case of Ebola, uh, we look about to see there was some sort of contagion effect based on the news information. 
So we look, for example, at Google posts. People would ask questions in the US, like, do I have Ebola, things like that. It was very interesting to read all that. And what we found that is that if you fit the standard statistical model, you get an okay fit. If you fit, if, if, if fit models that indicate contagion, you get the almost the best possible fit, and that's tied in particularly to uh, videos when people see it visually. The, this is this is so. This is one result we published an article someplace. I forgot maybe Lancet something. And then the the other one is would be mass shootings, schools mass shootings. So we actually look at that, and again, the same idea. And what we found out is, in fact, there is a copycat effect. What are the reasons behind that? That's a complicated issue. But once you see a mass shooting, then you can expect a school mass shooting, you can expect to see another within 13 days, plus or minus some confidence intervals. So there's indeed a contagion effect associated with the media and uh, with information and things like that. Uh, what are exactly the mechanisms that this gets done is, is not unclear, but uh, we have published now a few articles, and in fact, since uh, a couple of years ago, where in fact this is the case. I just, want, I just wanted to come in and just actually make a, just repeat a, a point more emphatically, which is notwithstanding Carlos's excellent sort of empirical evidence he's put forward there, we are miles away from where we need to be in terms of understanding, understanding behavioral response. And the reason for that isn't rocket science. You know, we spend $2 billion a year on R&D for a universal flu vaccine platform. Uh, anyone want to tell me how many zeros there is for understanding whether people will take it up? Right? And, you know, we need an order of magnitude more empirical work in this area. And, and how we sort of shift our mindset around that is, you know, is a, is a challenge for us all. Um, the Wellcome Trust have, have recently announced um, funding with the Department of International Development to try and build up a platform for rapid social science um, research in context of infectious disease outbreaks. It's a really good start. Um, but we need to be sort of tripling, quadrupling capacity in this area. And until then, what we'll have is like, you know, models that are the best that we can do, you know, put together by very intelligent, austere academics, and then just a suck it and see approach when, you know, the proverbial hits the fan. And that's not good enough. Yeah, I was just going to say that... Um... <clears throat> I think that what you're pointing out is a f one example of that phenomenon is the focus on syndromic surveillance that happens in many public health agencies, you know, certainly in the U.S. It's, I don't know if it's as widespread in the world, but there are many examples of cities that have chased signals in these electronic systems to no avail with extraordinary cost. And <clears throat> we're, so we're, we are worried that those things are not measured. I, don't, I haven't seen analyses of those kind of I don't, wouldn't call them wild goose chases, but false signals in the noise. I did see Hawaii was clever during the monitoring period when people were returning with Ebola, and enormous resources had to be redirected to monitoring, monitoring people on a daily basis in places around the U.S. with huge costs to regular public health practice. And so what Hawaii did eventually was to say, we did what we were told to do by the White House and by CDC, and these are all the things that we didn't do during that entire period. So at least they showed the trade-offs. They didn't really do an economic analysis the way you're talking about, but to trade-offs, they were they, they visually described it. And I think public health is zero sum like that right now. You can't just expand it in moments of need. Jennifer, please. Uh, this is a technical question that I think uh, Dr. Al Tarabi's comment uh, just now teed up quite nicely, which is that when you're going about uh, setting the parameters for that utility function that modifies your compartmental model, uh, how did you do that retrospectively, like as you were working towards the model development? But more importantly, how do we do that in real time when we're dealing with the next pandemic? What's the data that we need to collect? Because, you know, it's hard enough setting your basic transmission and recovery rate parameters, and, you know, we can get that from the data that we collect routinely. How, what data do you collect to inform these more advanced parameters? Uh, thank you very much. This is what I put the first slide about fitting models to data. Uh, it is not difficult. <laughs> okay, we can always do that. And, and I actually uh, uh, agree with uh, Dr. Turabi uh, about his saying. But what we, what we need to explore, right, is essentially uh, what did, how the decisions that people make influence what we're, what we're doing. And in the, in the current models, where we fit models to data and we have some estimates for that, we don't do that. For example, people talk about contacts and contacts of influenza. And there is a study in the Netherlands that, that checks all that. 
I bet nobody can replicate that study and nobody can get to those numbers. And if I get in the subway in Mexico City, nobody can tell me how many contacts I have per unit of time. So we need to have a new approach. I know that if I spend a lot of time in the subway, that I may like, very likely to have an infection. So we have resident times, things that we can measure. In the general idea of context, the general idea is how people make decisions, and that's a complicated issue, and that's what I join forces with some economists. Not that I know economy, I think I, most of the time I don't understand what they're telling me. But, but, but the fact that it makes sense that did you value some, something and it has some reasons, uh, something that, in fact, that uh, I don't want to get infected, I might, take, I might take some particular decisions. Now, when you do this in economics and in general theoretical models, they always assume that there is a concave function. And this is just a simple assumption. And then there is an optimum associated with that. And they do that. But what this model tells me, essentially, is what is behind uh, the, the impact of behavior. And the fact that people change their behavior, in fact, reduces the kinds of epidemics. It makes, in some sense, uh, if you have, uh, uh, you are looking at long-term dynamics where there are endemic diseases, it makes things a lot more complicated. You might get oscillations and things like that. But in general, it, it changes what they do. So there is a difference between um, doing, uh, doing, uh, figuring out what might be possible, right? And not, for example, people ask me, you know, what is an interesting question in biology? You say, why I have five fingers and not four? <laughs> and, and you can actually show mathematically that if you do developmental biology, right, and put all the biochemical reactions, that we might have been individuals with three fingers with five but not four. This is a bifurcation, and it is a bit odd. And Jean Murray in Oxford did it a long time ago and other people. So that's what theory tells us. That doesn't solve the problem. So, uh, so Anna, they're going to call you Anna. It, it put it very, very right. This is this is this is an area in diapers, but in fact, it tells us right that behavior is very critical, and that these general ideas, these general ideas, are very, very important, and that they are being ignored, and that I think we have to devote resources to do that, not only for for current diseases, but for many other situations. If I may add, so, yep, that. Well, Carlos says was right, except in the pressures, particularly in an outbreak, and once you've seen one pandemic, you've seen, them, you've seen one, and you cannot assume the next outbreak is going to have. When it comes to modeling and somebody asks, and they will, and they have, if we close schools, what will be the impact? And we model away. Where do we get those variables from? Well, we only can get from history. And we have to say, in the past, we've closed schools, and here's the impact. And we've done some of the measuring. We, you get lucky every now and then. And we got out of Texas a naturally occurring experiment. I showed some of the data. One district closed schools, another district didn't. Small problem, though, was the school district basically closed for one week. So if there's a more severe pandemic than 2009 and there's a real delay in the, in the delivery production and delivery of the vaccine, and we might say, oh, we also know from modeling and also just common sense that if you really want to slow down the spread of the disease, you've got to close schools really early and you've got to keep them closed for a long time. Okay, so now where am I going to assume about behavior when we've got very different set of conditions than what we actually measured in the field in 2009? And the answer is, well, we will assume, and if we do close schools for a long time, we will measure, and we will reverse engineer and say, oh, this is the level of compliance. But at some point, if you want a quick answer, um, you have to make assumptions. The key part in modeling and in economics, though, is then to be able to clearly and unequivocally explain to policymakers what you've assumed and the consequences of your assumed. That's why when I present, there are no math equations I present because I can see what that does for most audiences. They faint to various degrees. I try to keep the graph simple and I try to I keep the model simple and say, I assume this level of compliance. Watch what happens when I change it. I'm not sure what the level of compliance will be. You're going to have to bet on a certain minimum level. That's a, try to identify what's the minimum level at which you say, you know, if I assume that level, it's really not worth it. So I'm going to go forward and close schools, but in doing so, I acknowledge that I'm getting this level of compliance, and perhaps I'll put in some monitoring system that will allow me to measure it and know that that's, I'm trying to measure at least that level and if I'm not getting it, I'm going to reverse my decisions. So you provide them tools going forward, but there's no absolute accuracy of prediction. 
And I think that's the other part of people in this room think that we can build a model that accurately predicts. That's not what the models are for. It's to tell you what are the levers and how much we know about those levers and what happens if we push and pull at those levers. I just very want, quickly want to highlight actually some um, good methodological practice that has been supported by the CDC um, and by UNICEF of rapid opinion polling in emergency outbreak scenarios. Um, it, it's not a panacea, but it can provide near real-time information that you know, historically we've used for guiding resource allocation decisions in the field. But actually, we could see a world where we have a set of pre-agreed frameworks <laughs> that allows us to deploy sort of these rapid assessment tools, and they feed back into emergent models. Um, and maybe if we kind of iterated on that, you know, one of the things that Jeremy Farrar recently said is, you know, we used to think about peacetime and wartime infectious disease outbreaks. There is no peacetime. So we've got all of this opportunity now to improve our iteration of models live in the field. But we first need to build that foundation, that, that capacity to do these rapid polls in an ethical, sort of robust um, and reactive manner. So you believe what people say on us? <laughs> Young and naive. Yeah. Um, so we seem to be averaging about 10 minutes per question. Um, and I've got uh, one, two, three, four, f five folks in, in line. So why don't we switch to doing two, two questions at a time and then, and then take them on, and hopefully we'll be able to get through the list. So I have, uh, I have Katharina and then Anna. Yes, um, thank you. I have a question to Carlos. Um, you showed that the adaptive human behavior has a dampening effect on the pandemic. So as prevalence or incidence goes up, individuals will increase their demand for prevention. Now, I wonder, though, when we are in an eradication or elimination situation where prevalence is going down, um, what will then happen to human behavior? I mean, economists predicted like 20 years back they had this term prevalence elastic demand for prevention and that this behavior, as prevalence goes down, individual will demand less prevention will make it progressively harder to eradicate um, a disease where we are very close um, to the last case. So what's your comment on that? Yeah, I was going to respond to your presentation about measurement and just sort of second that, but you focused on post hoc measurement, which is extremely expensive and often is too late to inform the decision. The example I gave in South Africa the decision had already made to purchase expert for the whole population, and there's no way they were going to disinvest in that decision, even if the, they were just going to adjust that decision. But I wanted to sort of follow up on the comment that was made. You're talking about real-time data collection, but what about pre-epidemic data collection? And, and, and can you not identify certain parameters that you consistently are facing? And not just historical compilation of data, which I, I can see you're using, but what about experimental evidence? And, and we're sitting here as a group of economists. There's plenty of behavioral experimental evidence that is there. Do you ever use it in your models? Have you ever considered using it? I know we use, for example, uptake. We do experiments around uptake that p help us predict, say, self-testing for HIV. Is that used in, in, in your settings? So I absolutely agree. I, I don't think there's any reason to restrict the tool set that we should use. Um, and I think preemptive uh, empirical work that improves our understanding of how population is going to respond in the face of an outbreak uh, is immensely important. Um, personally, I am skeptical around the heterogeneity of preferences being consistent in states of outbreak. Um, I think about similar literature with, around decision making for cancer treatment. If you ask patients about how involved they want to be about their cancer treatment, they don't have cancer, everybody wants to be super involved, but the state decision making changes in the face of greater threat and uncertainty. Um, and so just with that caveat, I, I still think there's a need to be doing sort of live analysis. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely think that we, we can and we should expand um, any relevant behavioral input into our modeling. Um, uh, and honestly, I, I don't utilize it. I would love to be able to build a career where I begin to do that kind of work. Um, but it's interesting, I mean, and this is just as an aside, Personally, I'm applying for postdocs next year and deciding which direction to take my academic career in. And I can either go down the health services research route, very well funded, sort of consistent, stable job, or I can try and do behavioral responses to public health emergencies. Um, and it's much more interesting, it's where my passion lies, but I can't see where the funding streams are going to be. 
Um, and it's this capacity issue that comes up again and again. Yeah, uh, on, on the stand is critical, and 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 and, and how how to model behavioral response and is 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 really a big challenge. And I think this economic perspective that was uh, sort of pushed by Eli Fenickel when he was at Arizona State, unfortunately, Yale stole him. Um, it's, 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 it's the important. So I work with Charles parents. I work with several people that do that, and that has been very interesting to do that. But before, we used to model this in sort of phenomenological way. So i give you an example of something that I wrote some time ago. I think I forgot to publish, and then 10 years later, I said maybe I should publish. It has to do with um, the HIV epidemic in San Francisco in the homosexually active population. And the general idea that we said is that recruitment depends on the levels of infection. As we know at that time, uh, th that population was very well informed. So if I'm a, 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 a homosexually active person and want to go into a, a welcoming environment, certainly the Castro district was the right one. But if I know the levels of HIV infection, which were well known, I would be foolish to go there. So we make that assumption that the recruitment into the population of something like the San Francisco homosexual actors, uh, population in, in, in San Francisco was dependent upon the levels of infection. And what, what the model predicts essentially, yes, it goes down, but then after it goes down, it goes back up, and then you get oscillations. And what it was very interesting, and that's what we decided to publish it later on, is that that's exactly what happened in the Castro district when they reopen the bad houses, they reopen everything else. Uh, HIV is an uh, incredibly devastating disease, but now death rates have gone dramatically down and behavior has changed since in response to that. But it, it wasn't modeled in a, in a precise way. And, and modeling in a precise way is not so much that we might need it to make predictions or to make policy, but to gain some understanding, right? To, what, what it is true is that behavior does matter and behavior does change situations. And in many epidemics, I studied the influenza epidemic in Mexico, I showed that uh, we tried to use the transportation and movement of people, and we could not predict the patterns of influenza in Mexico. Once we put the schools closings, and, and, uh, and the fact that after uh, the dramatic predictions that many people might die didn't got fulfilled, fortunately, how people start going back to the regular level of activity. And then in that way, we could actually fit the epidemic in Mexico over a couple of years. So it does matter how do we use it. I think it, 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 if you want to make a policy decision, an immediate decision, you have an emergency, obviously you have to use the simplest possible tool to do it. But you want to gain understanding so that you create a new toolkit about thinking about these processes, then you need theory. And, uh, and I think that uh, a theory that has ground in some applications. So that's what, what we need to put in many of these models is things that can be measured. So I say context is very difficult for me to measure. Residence times, yes. If I spend a lot of time in an infested malaria region, most likely I will get malaria. And, 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 and that could be measured. If I spend a week, there is a certain amount. If I spend a month, and that can actually be measured. And I think in the case of tuberculosis, the same, and many things like that. So there are things that can be measured that are different, that are not being measured, and we have to rethink this, uh, these processes and also what is the epidemiological unit. We often we refer often to the individual, when in many cases might be household or generalized households of other ideas. If I just may add, no, I, I'm hearing measure this, and so everybody comes out of this session this afternoon or right to tomorrow, needs more measurement of human behavior. The truth is, particularly in outbreaks, large-scale outbreaks like pandemics, there's only a limited amount of resources that we have for real-time measuring, and we have to be very careful and very judicious in how we use it. In 2009, we did measure uptake of who got vaccinated. We knew, because the federal government owns the influenza pandemic, how much vaccine was delivered. But we did not have an instant registry of who got vaccinated. So what we did in order to measure who's actually uptaking the vaccine, because that's the real measure of human behavior, because if you deliver the vaccine and nobody gets vaccinated, yeah, you have one level of response versus that. We had to do it by phone, constant rolling phone survey. And somebody says, that sounds antediluvian. And I said, you got a better idea? School closures. We do not have, to this day, there is no central registry 
of unplanned school closures across the U.S. We have at the CDC, you know what they do? They check the Facebook pages, et cetera. Not every school system or school does it. We have got some colleagues doing some research as Twitter. And that. There is no legal requirement for schools to announce to even secretaries of education in a given state that they're having an unplanned school closure for, say, a day or two. Of course, in the pandemic, and the secretary of education for a given state said we suggest closing the schools. Most closed schools will do it. But will we be able to track when schools close, and more importantly, when they're open? Because you know each school district will have different dates for those. And we don't have a central registry, so we're going to have to figure out a way. Now, at a certain point, that takes a lot of person power, and we can't do everything that you suggest. Oh, let's measure this. Let's measure that behavior. Let's track that. We have to prioritize. And I think that's one of the, also the criteria and, and critical tasks going forward is pri prioritizing which behavior, uh, trends we want to track, and what will it tell us, and how will that impact decisions as we go forward? How, what would we alter in our response? Not everything can we alter in behavior, and not everything is of equal value. Um, so, so I failed as a moderator here because we have, at my count, three additional folks who want to ask questions, and we are now out of time. And, and lunch is next. So um, I, please, those of you who still have questions, corner these guys um, <laughs> before a sandwich or after. Um, but. Uh, if you will please join me in thanking our panelists for, for a really interesting discussion today.